So I'm mostly going to be probably applying this to our preachers here, the, the guys that get up here and preach behind the pulpit. Um, obviously, all, everybody in here, I could say, like, we're all preachers. We have a job, do the work of an evangelist, and go out and preach the gospel. and everything. But there's a difference between preaching the gospel outside these walls and the ministry of actually preaching to God's people. And in the case of Ezekiel, of course, he's preaching to the, um, I start saying nation of Israel, but I guess primarily Judah. And, and he is uh, uh, declaring the judgment of God upon these people who are not doing right. And so, like, obviously he's got a huge audience out there. Uh, and he's, he's, he's trying to preach to God's people. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that was Jewish was saved. We understand that. Uh, there are certain people that did not uh, ever put their put their faith in God's plan and all. But uh, uh, at the same time, the majority of them, I believe, were God's people. And you know, even though they're living in sin, doesn't mean they weren't His people. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to get too too deep into that, but. Uh, but here, as he's preaching this, you got to remember that the things that they're saying, for instance, in the text he, he just read, it talks about the watchmen. And I remember hearing this my whole life. Uh, my mom probably remembers this. We went to a youth rally when I was a kid, and the, and the preacher uh, had some fake blood. It was close to Halloween time, and he had some fake blood, and he preached from this text. And it's talking about the watchmen on the walls, and, you know, if you don't declare... Uh, the warning to the people and then destruction comes upon them you know your blood their blood is on your hands and so he's preaching this message and all of a sudden he gets this fake blood and he's like the blood is on your hands and he goes like this and isn't the blood like dripping down his hands and stuff like that and he's like if you don't go out there and preach then the blood's on your hands and stuff like that it's a very effective message <laughs> in, in a way like it stuck with me all these years and I know that many times I heard this text preached and I, I thought that I probably even used it myself. Like if you're going out and you, if you fail to go out there and preach the gospel to somebody and they die and go to hell, the blood's on your hands. Only problem is that's not really what's going on here because, uh, you know, first of all, the blood's on them. It's on them if they didn't receive Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we want to tell them the gospel. Uh, the gospel's been preached into the world. Jesus Christ is lifted up. And we want to go tell them. But actually, Ezekiel is preaching to... Uh, the nation here, primarily to the Ju to Judah, the southern tribe, who is going into captivity. And if you remember, God's bringing judgment upon them. He brings Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, they take him into Babylonian captivity. And God's telling Ezekiel, go and preach to these people and warn them that the destruction is coming upon them because of their disobedience. It's not really talking about going to hell. Uh, it's just saying, like, you know, you guys are going to, as a nation, are going to go through some destruction and they're going to come in. You remember, I think it's Ezekiel 8. He talks about the man that comes, the angel, and he's got an ink horn by his side. And he, and he marks on the forehead of all of those faithful people who mourn for the city and they're repentant. And, uh, and he marks on them and then they're safe whenever that destruction comes. So you got guys that, in that nation that were, you know, trusting the Lord. They were trying to do right and obey him. You got Jeremiah, you got Ezekiel, you got Daniel, you know, you got people that were alive during that time who did love the Lord. But when you're reading this, it makes it sound like, hey, there was nobody, like the entire nation, like the reason the judgment's coming, the reason uh, they're going to go into captivity and they're going to be slain in the streets and all in the mountains and all that is because of their disobedience. Well, for the most part, that was true. The entire nation comes in and gets slaughtered, uh, save these few who are uh, who are sealed on their forehead. Now, that sounds a lot like the 144,000, and some people have tried to make that comparison. I think it's a little bit of a stretch. You know, obviously, that, that somewhat of a comparison can be there, but ultimately what it's showing is that God will always protect those. I mean, think about uh, who's the other one, Josiah. Uh, right before the captivity comes, God promises Josiah because he had humbled his heart and he had done right. He's like, I'm going to spare you from that, but nevertheless, I'm still going to judge the nation. And he pulls him out of here. God will always deliver his people from that are actually serving him and trying to do his work. He's always going to deliver them from that. Uh, but the judgment is going to come upon those people who are disobedient. And so what we're talking about is a man who is called to preach to his peers, if you will, to people who they know the, they should at least know the law. They should know who God is. They should know how to serve him. Quite a bit different than going out and preaching 
to the world. Now, now to some people, there is no difference because to some people, and the Lord will, and Thursday I'm going to preach on the holiness movement and the history of that and, and a lot of the error that came from the holiness movement. And so here's the problem is that you maybe have seen this online, some, some street preachers with bullhorns. How many people have ever seen the, the guys? i got a couple names in my mind, but anyway, uh, it's not important. And they go onto the street and say, everybody better repent. You know, God's coming to judge you, and if you don't repent and get your life right and all this stuff, you're going to go to hell. And, the, and, and warning them, but they're warning them by saying, hey, you need to repent, and you need to start obeying God and keeping the commandments and all that. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not preaching the gospel. You know, if you were preaching to God's people and you said, hey, you need to repent or else God's going to destroy you, you know, church, you need to start doing the work or else he's going to remove your candlestick. Like you can make that application, but going out into the world and preaching to the lost, you're not saying, you know, hey, it's, it's a totally different type of preaching is what I'm getting at. Okay, so I didn't mean to spend all that time on the, uh, uh, as part of the introduction, but I want you to just realize that we're talking about Ezekiel's ministry which I would compare today to more of like a pulpit ministry, like those who call themselves Christians and they come to church, they're going to get preached at. Now, we understand a good portion of churches out there that call themselves Christians. I'm not even saying they're not Christians. I'm just saying a good portion of those under the umbrella of Christianity uh, do not want preaching that challenges them. They do not want preaching that says, hey, you need to quit living in sin. Uh, God's going to destroy you. You know, maybe you got to... Uh, kick, kick you out of church until you get right and all this kind of stuff. That is not popular preaching. It goes against what the majority of people do. And in fact, so many people have got evangelism and church mixed up that, you know, they can't tell the difference. And they think that church is about getting lost people in here. And, oh, you got to be careful what you say and how you do this because you don't want to offend people. You want them to get saved. And uh, brother, <laughs> brother, just, uh, Josh got a little bit of a taste of that whenever he was preaching last week, and you know, the whole whole row of people walked out. And I know he was thinking that they walked out because of something he said, because he was saying some things that would offend some people about the Jews and stuff like that. Uh, and a lot of people just think, like, oh, you don't ever say anything bad about the Jews. That's anti-Semitism. And anyway, so that wasn't it at all. Somebody was sick, and they had to leave. Okay, we found that out later. <laughs> but he had to keep on preaching, you know, and, and even because he's saying this. And so... Uh, you know, sometimes you're in a congregation and you're preaching and, you, and it's not not everybody necessarily is going to like what you have to say. Now, obviously, when you're preaching door to door, you're preaching to people about the gospel. Not everyone's going to like that either. OK, I've even had people that claim to be saved and they're just like, I just don't think this is appropriate. And it's like, how is it not appropriate to talk about going to heaven? <laughs> you know, and if you are saved, you should be so happy that someone's out, out here doing this. But. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of mixed up type stuff right now. But when we get behind the pulpit and when we're preaching to God's people, uh, I believe we can learn something here from the book of Ezekiel. And I, we started in, in chapter 33 because it really shows like his being the watchman and preaching and warning people about the destruction because of the rebellion and stuff like that. But mostly we're going to be towards the beginning of the book for the sake of this sermon and I want to talk about the art of preaching the art of preaching oh, I went way too far okay and so I want to kind of walk you through just kind of looking at how God deals with Ezekiel here and if you you know you've been reading through and and uh, as you go through all the prophets really it's interesting how similar all the stories are how God speaks to prophets how he gives them his word and then how they have to go through the same process Ezekiel goes to before they go out and they begin preaching his word and so we're going to look at the life of Ezekiel here and see kind of I guess you can say the uh, um, the I don't know the, the kind of order the way things go whenever you receive a message and you got to preach a message uh, for the Lord okay we're being a mouthpiece for him and preaching his word. Okay, number one, a preacher must hear from God. Now, I believe you can get up here and, and I could get up here and read something from God's word, make a few points about, you know, what I just read, and praise the Lord, God's word is not going to return void. I mean, it's, it's good. There's nothing, you know what I mean? I haven't caused any harm for sure. But 
I think maybe this is what the difference is between preaching and teaching. And I, I tend to be a lot more, I, I believe I'm more of a teacher than a preacher. Like I tend to say like, hey, here's what the Bible says and, and let's dig in and see why the Bible says that. Nothing wrong with that. I think it's good. I think that it's needed in the house of God. We need teachers. But I think the preaching and mostly when we see God talking to prophets and saying, hey, go to the people and say, thus saith the Lord. It's a little bit harder preaching. We need that too. Churches need that too. And, uh, and this is particularly what he's talking about. And, uh, and so here's the, the, the way that things go. Like a preacher has to hear from God. Now, obviously, like I said, anything you read from God's word is from God, right? This is his message. A little bit different than in Ezekiel's day where God says, hey, go tell the people this. We can read in the Bible now and see what God told Ezekiel, but he's not going to tell us any, any new kind of a thing, a new revelation. It's already there, like all the way up to the book of Revelation. That's already, uh, it's already happened in God's eyes. So we don't need to do that. But I still believe that it's important that we have a sense in which the Holy Spirit has given us a message. He's given us something to say, and, uh, and we have heard from God. Look at chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, that I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Okay, so he's going to see a couple visions here. Um, chapter 1, chapter 10, he kind of sees it again. And, and God's going to come back to him several times and give him a message to preach. <clears throat> but here's what's interesting. Like, this is exactly like we see in the book of Isaiah, you know, as far as like God reveals himself. And it's even very similar, uh, you know, in, in Sunday nights. I don't know if anyone's followed along at all. Uh, in Iola, I'm preaching on visions of, I mean, not Sunday nights, Wednesdays, preaching on visions of heaven. And so the, originally I was just thinking specifically about heaven. Most of it has been about visions of God, which, of course, God's in heaven. But uh, all of these visions are the same. It's describing a man on a throne. It's describing, in some cases, like a firmament. It's describing very detailed in Ezekiel 1 and 10. And uh, that's what I'm preaching on this Wednesday. And so, uh, praise the Lord, I get to preach out of Ezekiel twice this, this week. I love that. And so, interesting how many times the same process happens. God reveals himself. Uh, the, the, what they see, even back with Moses sees the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of times God's going to speak to his people. He reveals himself. They see him, uh, which, you know, uh, without going into long detail, like I believe it has to be the son that they see, like God, the son, right? Because, uh, no man has seen the father, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to get too distracted on that. <laughs> so, uh, but they see this. They see the reality. It hits them. They know that this is real. They know this is true. And then there are certain, you know, things that follow that uh, that I'm going to get to here in a minute. But they, they, they have seen a vision of God. They're motivated. They understand they have a job to do. Uh, God has revealed himself to me, a holy God. And has said, hey, this is my message. Go tell the people, thus saith the Lord. And then the conviction within us is like, we got to go tell people what God said. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have a book. I meant to bring a stack of books a long time ago. We preached through, uh, you know, we were, do, we were doing some uh, different homiletic type course uh, class. Uh, we we're doing some uh, practice. What was the word I'm looking for? Like, it's, it's homiletics, but anyway, I'm not trying to, like, sound smart or something. It's just like the study of preaching. And, uh, and so I've introduced this book that I got when I was taking that class in Bible college uh, that was from, it was just a testimony of Sam Davison. This is my journey to biblical preaching. And uh, anyway, some people in here have it. I wanted to bring a stack. I got like five, six more and uh, let you read. You can sit down and read it in one sitting, but it's pretty neat. It's a pretty neat book. And maybe we'll leave a couple copies there. People can read it and put it back or whatever, just so others can read it. But, um, but in, that pa in that book, that little book, he talks about, uh, and what happens, what it is is actually somebody sat through his, one of his classes because everybody loved his homiletics class. And so somebody just sat through his class and, the first couple classes um, of the homiletics, he just talks about his testimony. And so somebody just wrote that out while he was, while he was doing it and then tur turned it into a book, okay? But he tells this story in there about how when he first started preaching, and now he's a great, he's a great preacher. And I, I imagine he was probably pretty good back then as well, but, uh, but he preached at a church. And another man, it wasn't his pastor, but another man in the church said, hey, 
why don't you come out to, uh, to dinner and eat with me? And he's like, no, no. He, did, he said he didn't even, by his testimony, he didn't even really care for the guy. He didn't like him that much. And so he's like, no, I, I, don't, I got other things to do, whatever. And he's like, no, 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 you're going to come with me. And he's like, you know, mad about it. And he goes and he sits down and then they're getting ready to eat. And he's like, what's this guy want? He gets on my nerves, all this kind of stuff. And the guy said, you know, next time a preacher asks you to preach in my absence, he said, I would, and I would, <laughs> the way we do things, like I want guys to preach, I want them to learn, okay, so I wouldn't do this, but I'm just telling you his testimony. He says, the next time you get up here, to, or the pastor asks you to preach, I would appreciate it if you just turned him down. By this time, Brother Sam's like, I'm boiling. He's just like, how could this man say this to me? What's he talking about? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, he's like, I don't think that you should preach because I think you're getting up there and you're preaching something. You're not preaching what God you're not preaching a message that God has given you. And Brother Sam's like, what is he talking about? He was mad, and then he got to thinking about it, and the guy's like, tell me the message you preached. Tell me that God gave you that message. And Brother Sam was just really humbled and said, you know what? He didn't give me that message. I didn't hear from God. And so according to his testimony, from that day forward, he purposed in his heart, like, before I get up in the pulpit and I preach a message, I want to know that God gave me that message. And uh, maybe that's the the secret, right? Why he's such an effective uh, uh, speaker right now. But the reality is anytime we get up to preach God's word and be a mouthpiece and say, hey, thus saith the Lord, we should have heard from God. Now, I'm, pre- I'm going to tell you right now, like there are certainly times uh, that I get up here and I'm kind of winging it. Like I wasn't really like hearing from God. I wasn't really, uh, you know, there wasn't some kind of great thing. I just got to be honest with you. Sometimes I get up here and, uh, and I'm just trying to preach like I threw something together out of necessity kind of an idea. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. If you do and you're preaching something from the Bible, like it's not hurting anybody. It's still good stuff. Uh, but preaching the way Ezekiel was preaching and the way God's prophets preached uh, to his people was a particular thing where they heard from God and they had a message to preach. So, how do we even prepare ourselves to that? How do we hear from God before we actually get behind the pulpit and preach a message from Him? Well, I think, number one, we've got to spend a lot of time praying and asking that God to give us a message, asking God that He'll work in our hearts, and, and then we've got to listen to where He's leading us. Like, I can't explain to people how the Holy Spirit works in somebody's uh, heart, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes people will say, like, well, and the I, I could feel the Holy Spirit telling me such and such, and then some people will laugh and say, hey, the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. Hey, you don't know what that person felt or what made them think the Holy Spirit was leading them that way. Uh, I definitely have times where I'm like, man, the Holy Spirit is, very, is making it very clear to me that this is what I'm supposed to be preaching or this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I definitely believe the Holy Spirit works that way. And so we need to be sensitive, pray that God will direct us, and just trust that the Spirit's leading us in the way uh, that he is. Okay, but here's what happens when a person knows that they've heard from God. <clears throat> when, when you see all of these guys, stand, you know, they, they get this vision of God, God's holiness, right? I keep going back to Isaiah. We'll look at that here in a minute. Um, you know, and, and, they, and they look and they marvel at his holiness. They marvel how good he is and they, he's, he's real to them, right? I mean... God's re- I'm sure God's real to everybody in here. We believe in him. We know he's true. But there are moments where you can just feel his presence and feel like, man, God is making himself known to me right now. Some people say God showed up. Well, I don't like using that terminology because God's always there. <laughs> you know, he doesn't show up sometimes. But I try to say it like this way. Like if I'm praying for that, like, hey, God, make your presence known. Like just make it. We know you're there, but just fill us with the spirit. Get the distractions out and just make your presence known among us man when you feel that when you feel that there is nothing you can do except be humble (laughs) there is nothing when you feel the presence of god and you feel like god's giving me a message god has a job for me to do you can't show me one man of god in the bible who god gave a message to um, who made himself known to him who didn't fall flat on his face and say woe is me (laughs) i'm undone you know i can't i don't deserve this why are you asking me to do this i can't i can't be this And I'll tell you this, when you come face to face with the Holy God, it is very humbling. And you know what? A lot of men right at that point in their life will drop out from being a preacher. (laughs) A lot of guys will say, I can't handle that, man. I'm not, I don't even want to preach anymore. I can't tell you how many people they started out with the intention to preach and they realize the gravity of the situation. They realize how much is in their, uh, on their plate. 
and, and, and what responsibility they have. And they're like, you know what, I think I'll just find something else to do, you know. I'll go be a shoe salesman or something, you know, because uh, this is a big responsibility. Well, we should, we should feel that way because guess what? None of us are worthy. None of us are holy. I mean, we're holy through Christ Jesus, but none of us live a life that is clean enough to be able to stand up and say, let me just tell you what God said. You know what I'm saying? We don't deserve that opportunity, that, that right, that privilege. <clears throat> But if you know that God has given you a message and chosen you and said, hey, you, I've got a message for you to give people, it should humble us and not be like, hey, man, I just thought of some great thing to preach, you know, or whatever. No, God gave me a message. I've got to deliver this message, and I have nothing to do except to humble myself to it. And then number two, I need to submit to it. Look at Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, verse 8. And actually, this whole, ch- I, I got to just read the whole chapter. Okay, so start with verse 1. Uh, not the whole chapter, but st- start in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood a ser- uh, the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and twain, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. You know, I was just thinking this thought, like, maybe you think, like, man, yeah, well, if God would show up to me like that, I would do anything. Well, guess what? He just did. Did you read it? Like, this really happened. If you didn't really feel that, if you're just like, eh, you know, they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, uh, you know, and, and you didn't really get what Ezekiel, I mean, what Isaiah was feeling right here, read it through a whole bunch more times. Just read it through. Compare that to Revelation 4. Compare that to all the other places in the Bible. And God, maybe he didn't show up and, ha- and give you a vision, but he did to these guys. And we can read it and say, like, man, God is good. And, and you know what? God spoke in the prof- to all of these prophets, you know, and as they, sp- were spoke- as they were spoken to, they wrote these things down. And we're reading eyewitness accounts of God dealing with these men and giving them his word. We can't help but humble ourselves and feel a little bit like Isaiah felt. And here's what he said uh, after he saw this. He, he says, post the doors. Uh, moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one flew, uh, I mean, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Let me just tell you that before we can preach a message, you know, this is an ideal word. Like I said, obviously we can get up here and we can preach and not necessarily go through these, but this is the way it should look, okay? God should give us a message that we should look at and say, who am I to preach this message? Like, like I need this. <laughs> I need to hear this. And the Bible says what? Judge not. You know, that whole Matthew 7, everyone wants to talk about judge not, right? Oh, judge not, lest you be judged. Judge not, lest you be judged. Yeah, exactly. Here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to realize that before I judge somebody, I better make sure that I'm not guilty of the things that I... Can you imagine somebody getting up here? I'm sure you can imagine it because I'm sure, you know, you've probably seen it happen before. But they have a problem in their life. They've got a, a beam in their eye, and they get up here and they preach about the speck in their brother's eye. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, of course, that is ridiculous. So we need to make sure that first God speaks to us as the preachers We deal with that in our life. We humble ourselves and say, God, I'm not worthy. And then God says, you know what? You are worthy because you're standing me in the righteousness of of Christ. And you are confessing that you're you're unworthy. And you're ready to get that right in your life, which is called repentance, right? And you're ready to go take that message so that somebody else can learn that. We first need to apply that message to us. Okay, so a preacher must hear from God is what I want to bring up for that first point. Number two. A preacher must be willing to be disliked. It's easy, you know, even as a, a pastor, okay, obviously if I walked into a church, a bunch of people that I don't know, and I've done that before a few times, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's a little bit, in one way it's, a hard, it's harder to preach, 
But in another way, it's easier because when you're done preaching, you just leave. And if you never see them again, who cares, right? You can get up there and preach and say whatever you want, and, and you don't have to worry about it. But as a pastor preaching to the same people, you know, week after week and maybe knowing a little bit about li their lives and maybe knowing some of the things that, that bother them or some of the things that they don't like to hear me preach or some of the things that they don't believe, you know, that I believe or, or all these kinds of things, it makes it harder for a preacher to start, you know, going down those roads because it's like, oh, this person's going to think I'm talking about them and they're going to be mad about this or that. You know what? A preacher needs to be willing to preach it anyway. Be willing to be disliked by even people that you don't want them to dislike you. You really want them to like you. Hey, you got to just preach. If God told you to preach something, why are you more afraid of people than you are of God? God told you to do it. Just do it. Just do it. So you got to be willing to be disliked. Look at chapter 3, Ezekiel 3, verse 7. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. You know what he said? You're going to be hard-headed. <laughs> Baptist preachers, we need some hard-headed Baptist preachers. I'm not talking about, like, like not listening to reason or not listening to God, or I'm not talking about that kind of hard-headed. I'm just saying, like, you know what? I'm just going to go in here with a forehead of flint, and, uh, and if somebody starts staring me down, I'm just going to stare them back down, and I'm going to keep on preaching God's Word, not to be a jerk, but because they need what I'm telling them. And, it, and it's a message from God, and I don't care if you like it or don't like it. That's what a preacher needs to do. Look. Isaiah was going, I mean, Ezekiel and Isaiah too, was going to a people who were out, just, just outwardly living in sin. In fact, God's going to show him, I think it's verse, I think it's chapter 8 uh, as well, the same chapter as the inkhorn, I think, where he's going to take them and show them how bad the sins are. Ezekiel already knew that the house was a rebellious house. He already knew they had a lot of sin, but he's going to, God's going to show him even deeper how bad it is. And that's the reality of it. Here's something that was told to me a long time ago. If you're preaching, always preach things realizing this, that it's, it's worse than you think it is. <laughs> it's worse than you think it is. Somebody put it this way. Like if you see a cockroach, you've probably got an infestation. It's not like, some, like one little cockroach just happened to wander into the church. I'm thinking in the church building right now. Okay, so uh, one little cockroach wandered into the church building and we killed it. And it's like, whew, I'm glad we got that cockroach. No, you better get the exterminator because you've probably got them living in the walls, under the carpets and all that kind of stuff, right? So you, you, it's just how it goes. And so you start a little bit of sin starts creeping in the church and you start thinking like, hey, I think some people are doing some things they shouldn't be doing or whatever. You know what I mean? You probably It's probably a whole lot worse than you think it is. But as a pastor, and speaking of Sam Davidson, I remember him getting up there and saying things like this, somewhat jokingly, tongue-in-cheek, but he would talk about how much he liked somebody. He would just say, hey, yeah, brother so-and-so over here, he's such a great guy. And he, he would say this a lot. It kind of became his little thing. But he'd be like, if you know anything bad about him, don't tell me, right, <laughs> because I believe he's a good guy. Well, that's true. Like, we want to look at everybody with rose-colored glasses, right? We want to look at everybody and say, like, you know, that person, surely they would never do anything wrong. I just love them so much. But you know what? If God gives you a message and says, no, people need to stop doing this, and you preach stop doing this, and you're like, ah, but that person, you know, they might not like me preaching that. Well, who cares? You're doing the word of God, you're, the work of God. You're preaching what God wants you to know. I mean, what's the people to know? Now, again, you know, how do you apply this? There's a few guys in here that get up and preach behind the pulpit, and so you can apply this. But everybody else, uh, here, here's how you can apply it. If you say, oh, I'm never going to preach, or maybe you're, uh, you're, maybe you're a woman, so you're certainly never going to uh, be preaching behind the pulpit like that. But, uh, but, you know, even other people, I don't have a desire to preach, or whatever the case is. Um, here's what you can do. Like, when you, get, when you go to any kind of message or here at church and somebody's up here and they're preaching, you know, you can think about this through, you know, the, the, how God's working in their heart and how God's doing this and allow it to, to help you to listen to what he's saying, listen to God's word 
and not be offended if somebody preaches against something you don't like or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Because that's 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 the that's the best way that you, best thing you can get out of this message right now. All right, but a preacher must be willing to be disliked. Um, this is why. Look at James chapter three. This is why. A reasonable person wouldn't really want this job. <laughs> now, now, there are people that want to be a pra- want to be a pastor, you know. Um, you know, there was maybe a day if you told somebody you were a pastor, they might think like, "Oh, you poor, you poor guy," <laughs> right? Nowadays, if you say, "Yeah, I'm a pastor," you're likely to have people think like, "Ooh." Because maybe they go to a mega church and they're like, ooh, he's a pastor, man. He's driving a nice car, got all the fancy. Like, he's got lots of money because there, there is a profession out there, you know what I mean, where a pastor, like if you looked up, like what if, uh, I was, I've been studying the Salvation Army. Like, I'll talk a little bit about that on Thursday, but um, studying about the Salvation Army. And so I was just curious, like, what are they? What are their generals and their officers or whatever? What do they get paid? And sure enough, there's like, pay, you know, there's a certain amount of pay. Like here, like every, I mean, independent fundamental Baptist, like there might be one preacher, he doesn't get paid a, a penny. And there might be another preacher that gets pretty good salary. You know, you just never know what it's like. But certain organizations, hey, this is what we pay. Our pre- you know, depending on what town you're in or something, but this is what we're going to pay them. And so there's like this average out there. And so you could look up, hmm, I think I want to be a, uh, a general in the Salvation Army. Let's see, what do they make? And you type it in and be like, that's not bad. Okay, yeah, I'll go do that for a career, okay? <laughs> so there are people out there that are like, hey, it wouldn't be so bad to be a preacher. You only got to work, like, you only got to work once a week, right? Sundays. <laughs> you only got to, oh, you got midweek service? Okay, so you got to work three times or, or twice a week. You got to work on Sundays. You got to work on Wednesday. You don't know anything about preaching if that's what you think, okay? You don't know anything about being a pastor if that's what you think. But that's okay. Somebody might think like, hey, that's a pretty easy job. I could do that. Well, look at James chapter 3. If you're going to actually preach God's word and not just like start a business, you know, a, a church business with cool music and everything looks nice and, and everybody wants to come be part of the social club or something like that. <clears throat> Here's what it says. My brethren... Be not many masters. And obviously we shouldn't call ourselves masters, but he's talking about people who are in charge of doing this work here. It says, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able, to also, able also to bridle the whole body. Look, nobody's able to bridle the whole body and then never say the wrong word. It's inevitable if you get up here and your job is to use your tongue to communicate a message, like you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be hated sometimes. And that's not just a preacher, but that's like anybody that's got a huge platform, like a, maybe in politics or, or something like that. Look, they're, everybody hates them because they're constantly saying things that, they don't, that, that there's going to be somebody out there that doesn't like it. Okay, And so the reality is a preacher needs to know going into this thing, if I'm going to preach God's word, it's pretty much just guaranteed people are going to be offended. People are going to get mad at what I have to say. Uh, people aren't necessarily going to like me, and that's okay. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. This is why, though, those who are applying this to themselves and saying, like, well, how, what can I get out of this even though I'm never going to preach? I tell you what you can get out of it. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse seven, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Well, wow, that sounds pretty arrogant. <laughs> you know, he's up there preaching and he's saying, like, obey them that have the authority. Like, he just wants me to do whatever he says. Now, here's why. For they watch for your souls. Hey, they're watchmen warning you. Destruction's coming. And guess what? If you don't heed that, the blood's on your hands. Okay. But if I get up here and warn you and say, if you keep living like that, this is going to happen. If you keep acting that way, your life's going to be destroyed. If you keep, you know, living in sin, it's not like you're like God doesn't see you. Be sure your sins will find you out. And if I'm preaching those kinds of things and then you still do and the blood's on your hands. If I don't warn you of those things, I'll be like, well, I don't want to rock the boat. I want everybody to be nice and happy and everything. Guess what? God's going to come in and destroy everybody and the blood's going to be on my hands because it was my job to warn the people. Again, we're not talking about salvation out there 
You know, we go pre preach the gospel and, get, and, and try to get people saved. But, you know, as soon as they get saved, you know what I want to do? I want to get them in the church and start preaching these things that are going to offend them. Not because I want to offend them, but because I want them to learn and I want them to grow. And they're going to kick against it and they're not going to like it. And they are going to get up and walk out in the middle of the, of the, of the service. I know that wasn't what happened on, on Sunday. but For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Okay, if, if I had full, rest, full restraint, which I believe I do in this congregation, this is a pretty good congregation to preach to, okay, because you guys want to hear the truth of God's word, I believe. <clears throat> but at least I, I'm telling myself that, <laughs> okay? So I'm not really worried. I preach on all kinds of things, and, and I'm not really worried, like, people aren't going to come back because, of, you know, anyway. But if I'm going to... If I'm going to preach that because it's good for you, and then I, because I know that you're going to, if I knew that you were going to resist that and you weren't going to like what I had to say, so I chose not to say it, but wait a minute, but it's good for you, but I don't want to say it because I don't want you to be mad. Who, who's getting hurt? You're getting hurt. Right, so you need to submit yourself to authority. I'm not saying you have to agree with everything I have to say. Like, certainly I could be wrong. All right, but if I'm preaching, hey, God's word says you shouldn't do this or that you should do this, don't get offended by it. Just say, like, he's saying this for my good. He's trying to help me. And, and, and he's the one that's going to give an account. Like, he's the one that's watching for my soul. And so I just want to get behind the scenes. And here's the reality. Here's what I found as a preacher. Like, you know, there's been times where I've preached and I've been like, oh, man. Uh, here, here's a couple. Here, all right. A couple examples, okay? Uh, you guys know how I feel about women women wearing pants, okay? So that's not, and you want to you want to make people mad and make people leave. Like that's one of the certain congregations. You say that, and it's going to make people mad, okay? And so uh, one time I was preaching on that. I was preaching on clothing, and two people came into the church that were, they hadn't been here. This is in Iola, but they hadn't been here very many times, um, and they were interested in joining the church. Now we've got several mem several lady members at our church in Iola that, that wear pants. You know, I mean, uh, pretty pretty regularly, like not to church uh, usually, but like in their own personal life, they don't have that conviction. But I still preach, you know, about gender specific and stuff. And sometimes that subject comes up, and I explain why my wife and my daughter don't don't wear pants. And I remember thinking, looking at these two ladies, thinking they are not going to come back if I preach this. And, uh, and, and I'm like, but I've got it in my message. I feel like God has given me a message, and I think I'm going to preach it. And so, like, we'll just see what happens. And I preached it. And, uh, and afterwards, like, I even kind of, you start reading into things. And I started kind of, like, reading their face. I'm like, oh, they didn't like that. They're not going to be happy. They're not coming back. And I was almost ready to apologize. Like, like if they came and they started getting offended, I, I was almost ready to be like, Look, you know, sometimes I preach some things and not everybody agrees. <laughs> like just something within me was like wanting to do that, but I didn't. And long story short, the two ladies that ended up eventually saying, like, I had no idea the Bible even said that. That's something that I had never even considered, the length of my hair or the or how I how I dress. And so it was just like, hey, can you tell me more about this? And here's what I realized at that moment. Like if we get up here as preachers and we're scared that we're gonna offend somebody. What we're really doing is harming all those people that just want to know what the Bible has to say. And the reality is the people that love what they love God's word and they want to know what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, uh, the law is pure. I was how's it go? It's in, uh, I think, uh, I think Psalm 12 it says nothing shall offend them. Anybody remember that? They, 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 they love thy law. How's it go? Great peace have those that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Something like that. I might have messed it up. Some. So you get the point, all right? And here's the truth. You love God's word. You're not going to be offended. You're not going to be offended because you, 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 you want to hear the truth. Okay, so here's what I've decided. Like, I, I want people, I'm not telling anybody to leave or something. And like I said, I, I'm, in a good, I'm in good company right here. But I want people in this congregation that are hungry for God's word, and they want to know the truth of God's word. So if somebody, because I say something that's in, the, in God's word, and they're like, eh, I, I didn't like that, and they leave and they never come back, like, you know, obviously I might check on them. I, I might be a little bit upset, you know, disappointed that they didn't come back. But that's fine. 
that's fine because I want people that aren't going to be offended because they want to hear God's word. Does that make sense? And so what you find is that oftentimes the ones who will listen to you and they want to know what God's word, they're going to love you for telling them the truth. And even if they don't 100% agree with you, they're going to love you because you are, are wanting them to know God's word. Okay. And obviously, that with, it shouldn't, I shouldn't even have to say, like, when we get up here, our preaching should be motivated in love and not just like, hey, I just think it's cool to pound on the pulpit and yell at people, and so I'm going to do that and be a jerk. That's a different kind of preaching that we're not interested in, okay? We want a message from God, and we want to do it in love, and even if it offends somebody, like, it's motivated, and I want what's best for you, okay? So a preacher needs to hear from God. A preacher needs to be uh, willing to be disliked. And then, just real quickly, a preacher must uh, get the, atten- the attention of his audience. Now, here's where I, I, I just be quite honest with you. Here's the part that I, oh, man, where's my water? Um, it's just a couple more minutes. Uh, here's the part that I, as a preacher, need to figure out. Okay, I'm not saying I'm a, if you preach enough times, eventually you'll be, I think anybody can be an okay preacher, right? But. Uh, but there is there is something about connecting with people. Like right now, everybody's eyeballs are on me. I don't see anybody sleeping or anything like that. But uh, but there are times where you're just like, I don't think anybody's really listening to me, you know. Or or after the sermon, like somebody starts saying something, and it kind of not contradicts, but like it's like it, it's clear by what they're saying that they didn't know that you just preached that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not. Don't get mad. Hey, I've done the same thing to preachers lots of times. Uh, but you know the, the the reality is that that happens sometimes. And so here's the thing, like if God gives me a message and it's really important and I want the people to hear it. And so I'm willing to preach it. I'm willing to, you know, be disliked if, 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 if need be, so be it. But then I get up here and nobody actually gets what I'm saying, you know, or they're not getting the message or they're kind of falling asleep or they're thinking about like what's for dinner or something like that. And I haven't communicated that message to them. What ha- has really accomplished? I have not really accomplished anything, right? So here's an interesting thing. Ezekiel is a great passage of scripture that talks about what I've heard some guys in Bible college call theatrics. Now, I'm not interested in theater. Uh, I don't want to be a, a theatrical preacher, right? Who is the guy that said, uh, they asked him how he draws so many people. I think, I don't know if it's, I think it was D.L. Moody, maybe. I don't know. How do you draw so many people? And he's like, He's like, I just light myself on fire and people come to watch me burn or something like that. Have you anybody ever heard that? Like, and I, I never heard him preach, but uh, apparently like that was the thing. Like they, they just came to see him all riled up and spitting and hollering and all that kind of stuff, I guess. And so uh, why does everybody want like to hear you preaching? He, I just light myself on fire and people watch me burn. Like, I'm not really interested in that. I'm not saying he was a bad preacher. I don't know. But but here's what I do want is I want people to if I'm spending the time preaching God's word, I want them to actually get God's word and hear it, okay? And so here's the interesting thing. Ezekiel, God actually gives him some things to do that will help people get his message and understand and listen. And, uh, and I just thought they're worth, uh, they're worth exploring here this morning. So number one, look at Ezekiel 4. Man, why am I struggling Ezekiel chapter 4. And I'm not going to take the time because there's just a whole bunch of like crazy stuff that God tells Ezekiel to do. But <clears throat> it says, Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray un- upon it the uh, city of Jerusalem and lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it and set a, a camp also against it and set battering rams round it uh, I mean, against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for the wall of, uh, of iron between thee and the city and set thy face against it and it shall be besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. All right, so he's going to keep telling them a whole bunch of interesting things to do. But I remember the first time I read that, I'm like, God's totally just telling him to have an object lesson. <laughs> He's going to build this little, you know, this clay tablet, and this is like the land, and then get this pan, this iron pan, and that's like the walls of the city, and build this little fort. And so he's explaining to them by, like, using this diagram. And uh, honestly, I, you know, there have been times where I got a little more creative and used some illustrations or some object lessons or something like that. 
uh, about the best I, I, I tend to do now is just kind of start telling a story. And I notice that that usually gets people's attention. Like, so I'll have a couple of stories that are kind of just, you know, help the message to get across or something, you know, but also we do the whiteboard and, and uh, there's different things that we might do. <coughs> Illustrations. I remember one that I remember uh, really stands out with me is uh, Brother Ted Inman in, in, at Southwest. He preached this whole message, and we didn't know it, but he had this, uh, he had this huge, like, fake coin in his pocket. Like, it must have just barely fit in there, and it's huge. Like, I don't know if it's cardboard or what, but it, it was like a, I don't know how it fit in there. But he preached, like, the entire message, and he got to this verse, and I don't, remember, I don't even remember exactly what the message was about. So uh, <laughs> there was some kind of disconnect. But, uh, but I do remember the illustration, and he's talking about, uh, you know, give that unto Caesar which is Caesar's and given to God which is God's and so he's like and so he said take out a coin and so he pulls out this humongous coin he's like so he pulled out a coin <laughs> and I don't know it just it was so hilarious and it was so like well done like the way he delivered it and and nobody knew that that coin was there but anyway you know you think sometimes like oh only children like that kind of preaching you know here's a funny thing about that children are very literal it's funny because we usually use object lessons and all that with kids and it works but actually, kids are very literal, so sometimes when we try to use these object lessons, they don't even get it, you know? Like, a, an example of that that I've always heard is, like, when you talk about, uh, you know, ask Christ into your heart. Like, we might say that to an adult, and they might understand what you're talking about. Um, that's a whole other subject that I don't want to get, get, get into, but anyway. But a child, like, they start thinking, like, whoa. And you've probably heard the illustration about the kid that was just, like, how tall do you think Jesus was? And they said, I don't know, maybe like six foot or something. Like, How tall am I? And so he's like, oh, that means Jesus is like sticking out of me, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they use that as an illustration saying, that's right, Jesus should be sticking out of you or whatever. But no, that, what that shows is that a little child doesn't understand the words that you're using. And you could go down the list. There's tons of stuff like that that the kids don't know. They, they're singing the songs and all that stuff, but they're not really making the application. You need to be very literal with kids. And they get it. They just get that. Whereas adults, we like to hear the stories and we like to hear it. So it's kind of like the backward, backwards. But anyway, we can use illustrations and object lessons and try to get the people to understand, tell some stories and get them to be like, oh, man, that makes sense now. We do it when we're preaching the gospel, right? We'll talk about the gift. And, uh, you know, if I was trying to give you a gift and I asked you, you know, pay $10, it wouldn't be a gift, would it? Like, I love that illustration because it helps people. Say, oh, I get it. Right. Well, we can do that when we're preaching. Uh, God's word as well, and people will make, make that. The, but the importance is making sure that they hear God's word, they know what God's word is. So a preacher should be willing, I mean, uh, uh, should get the attention of the audience. Illustrations, object lessons. Here's an interesting one Ezekiel 6 11. talked about people pounding on the pulpit look I'm not against that I just don't really do it and I wouldn't want to like be fake about it but uh, but here's what here what God told Ezekiel thus saith the Lord God smite with thine hand and stamp with thy foot and say alas for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel look when somebody does it gets everyone's attention and they look I'm not saying to do it like and some people overdo it you know or it's just like oh here he goes on a tyrant again like maybe that's just me in the flesh but uh, but like to go, it gets people awake and it helps them look. And, and so you're just making sure that they're listening to you so that you can tell them a serious message that God has for them. OK, a preacher must uh, try to get the attention of the people. So I had a guy one time say, like, hey, I, I usually spend this many hours in preparing my sermon and then this many hours doing this or that. And then, you know, polishing it up, or whatever. And then I'll, the last thing I'll do is I'll spend this much time like like practicing my theatrics. And I remember thinking like, that sounds really weird, <laughs> you know, practicing your theatrics, like, whoa. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> that wasn't very theatrical, but. <laughs> but you know, it, I, although you can go too far on that, like many times he did that. And I kind of remember him sharing on Facebook. Now this guy ended up being wicked, but anyway. I remember him sharing on Facebook some of the things that he did, and I'm like, hey, man, that's a great idea. Like, everybody would remember, you know, uh, to, you know, he came to, I'm not recommending this, but he came dressed as Moses one time or something like that, and he's preaching on, on Moses. Like, you know, again, that's not, you would think that's something that would apply to children, but hey, God tells Ezekiel to do these things. 
uh, you know, cut off your hair, cut off the hair of your beard and, 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 and put some of it here and put some of it there and scatter some of it uh, and, and burn the rest with fire. Like all those things had like were object lessons that he was tell, ex- describing while he was doing those things. These will ha- things will help people uh, pay attention and get your message. And the final thing is just simply this. Preachers must be willing to be patient and endure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I can't imagine Ezekiel, the amount of time that he preached. They were in captivity 70 years. I don't know exactly how long he was preaching this message. Probably the entire time that he, you know, he was there from the second year or whatever it was. And, uh, and God told him, like, the people aren't going to listen to you. <laughs> but keep preaching. Yeah. And, and this one point, he's, he's like on his side for like, I don't know. I don't even remember. Did anybody remember how many times on one side and how many times on the other side? And uh, and I don't know if it, I don't think it was just constantly on his side. I feel like it was almost like a clock in and clock out each day. Like, oh, there's there's uh, Ezekiel again. He's going to lie on his side again or whatever. But who cares? But the, the point was that he, man, what a long just investment to people who probably weren't even going to listen to him anyway. But he just was patient. He kept doing it. And eventually, you know, maybe he'll get through to somebody. Somebody will listen. And I just think about it like, you know, sawing down a tree, like you just got to keep on going and going and going and going and going or or gardening, you know, waiting for those roots to take down before, you know, eventually something's going to come up and it's going to start flowering. The preacher has to be patient and endure uh, all of these things. Okay, so you must hear from God, you must be willing to be disliked. You know, who cares if they don't like the message? They, it's, it's God that they're rejecting, you know, if they got a bad attitude about it. Uh, it, it, it has to be try everything they can to get the attention of the audience. Again, that's not always going to work. Some people just aren't willing to listen. And then finally, the preacher must be willing to be patient and endure again. If you're going to preach, maybe these things will help you. But if you're not going to preach, think about this whenever a preacher's getting up there to preach and, and, and uh, think of it from the other perspective of like, man, they're just trying to help me and they're just trying to give me what God's word says so that I can uh, benefit from it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the examples that you give us in the Bible that we can, uh, from which we can learn and grow. And, and, uh, and I pray, Lord, that you would help all of us uh, who get up here and preach to uh, to take it seriously, Lord, the job you've given us, and that we would uh, pray and seek your face and get uh, the message that you have for us, and then that we would work at delivering that message in such a way that people would hear it, understand it, and get it, and help us to be patient, endure that, and not to be afraid of those who uh, might not like the message or, or something, Lord, but Lord, I pray that you'll help us... Um, you know, perhaps most importantly, that help us be motivated by, number one, uh, fear of you and just honoring you, doing it your way. Number two, Lord, love of the brethren and, and not um, not to uplift ourselves by our preaching and not to uh, get in the flesh and, and be able to just uh, let off steam or something like that, but that we would do it because we love people and we love you and we fear you and we want your word to be preached, Lord. Help us do that and help those Uh, who are under the preaching and listening all the time, Lord, to just understand that and apply it to their lives and help them learn and grow from the truths of your word. Help us, Lord, as preachers to learn these things and grow before we can deliver them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand.